I have my very own ghost of Christmas that haunts me and jolts me awake at night. My nightmare is this. People dropping in, last-minute family gatherings, all the seasonal socialising, which should be joyful. But oh no, in my anxiety-provoked dream, this terrible, terrible thing happens to me. My fridge is bare. As if. But still, the thing about this time of year, you want to have your friends over, you want to be hospitable, you want to have a party, and yet it can be a complete nightmare. I do know that. I mean, certainly my mother, every single year, became frankly hysterical with what seemed to her to be the burdens of mass catering. So I'm clear on one thing. I don't want to make myself miserable in the kitchen trying to make everyone else happy at the party. So the food has to be really great to eat, but above all, easy on me. When I invite people over to eat, I want to create what feels like a munificent feast, but often I can only be really stingy with my time. I mean, there's just so much to do, things at school, things at work, shopping, wrapping. So this is where my party poussins come in. May look a bit pallid and uninteresting now, but they are really the thing. What I love is that you can come in with what feels like some Tudor banquet, piled up little birds ready to offer your guests. And I've got six of us for supper tonight bit of a girl's thing. And these are so simple to prepare. It means I can join everyone for a bit of a drink and then bring them back for supper. You need about a head of garlic. Don't get really big fat garlic cloves because the poussins don't take very long to cook. So if you're using big fat cloves of garlic, they'll keep a bit too much crunch and you want them sweet and melting. Need a lemon. I like to cut this into about 16, which means eight each half, not so difficult. And then tuck the juicy mini wedges into the tin of poussin. And when the lemon cooks, you get that charred citrus flavour, which is so Eastern Mediterranean. I need a bit of oil just to help the poussin scorch a little in the heat, so I'm drizzling some chilli oil because I like a bit of heat, especially if I had a drink. And now, the magic touch, I mean, it's nothing complicated, but it just changes this, it elevates it. This could be just small roast chicken, but it's not. It is truly something sensational. And this is how simple. Some salt. Pinch of sugar. Some cinnamon. And just imagine how lovely the house is going to smell when everyone comes back for supper. And on top of that sweet warmth of cinnamon, the warm fire of paprika. I find it easier just to mix this with my fingers. This is not so much a spice rub as a spice sprinkle because all you need to do is top each of these plumptious little poussins with the spice mixture. Normally, I'd think a poussin would take under an hour to cook, but because I've got so many of them crammed in here, I think be a good hour and a quarter, hour and 20 minutes. It means I can go out, join my friends for a drink, and then come back. So along with the party poussins, which will be ready any minute, I've got my festive couscous. So easy. I mean, everything I do is easy, so I don't know. But this is particularly easy. has to be, because I'm not really in the market for anything complicated right now. So there's the couscous. I'm going to put in some of these beautiful golden sultanas. Look at them, like edible topaz. I want some salt because although couscous should be almost like there's a blanket of starch and not too highly flavoured, I think it has to have a certain amount of force to it, otherwise 
you don't really feel like you're having a party of the taste buds. To echo the pusa, some cinnamon, and again, a teeny bit of paprika, but I want some earthier flavour going on. Just a hint, nothing too intense. A bit of cumin. And it's near sibling, I say that because I always use them together. Coriander. Just gonna have a little dibble about. Gorgeous, lovely. And then finally, and this is obviously how it cooks, some hot water from the kettle. And the couscous cooks by sitting under a helmet of cling and absorbing all the water. I'm going to get something else because even though I don't really want to do a vegetable, I think it's nice to have something else on the table and I cannot resist the luscious redness of these. They're called pepper dew peppers. They're kind of like the savoury version of a maraschino cherry. Right, so I'm going to get on with the couscous. It looks absolutely ready. And now a final Christmas touch, a few jewels. So now a little bit of seasonal green alongside the Christmas red, a bit of coriander. Sorry, Claire, but do you mind taking this to the table proudly? You know, lovely. Okay, so that's the couscous. Now we're going to get the poos poos. Oh, oh, there we are. It's a bit hot. Here we are. The pièce de résistance. This is my mother's regular Christmas pudding. It's easily scaled Mont Blanc, which is to say, a kind of ridiculously simplified version of that chestnut chocolate meringue and cream pudding. You need to whisk the cream. It won't take very long. I suppose if you wanted to whisk this ahead, you could. You could just do it before you went out when you did the poussin and just put it in the fridge. But I'm very happy to come and have a bit of activity now, burn off some of the alcohol. And now, finally, I'm going to crumble a bit of these meringues. They're shop-bought, but good. Right. So that's ready. This is going to go on top, but on the bottom, I want some good dark chocolate. You could grate, I find it easier to chop. Anyway, you want fairly small pieces. So I think we are ready for the grand assembly. So think culinary geology. In other words, Mont Blanc is a mountain. So I'm going to do some soil. And then I'm going to do the mountain itself in the form of a really luscious can of sweetened chestnut puree. This is my idea of absolute heaven. I could just eat it spoon straight from the tin. Okay, in this goes. Not too much. Everything is very rich and sweet. Not that that's a bad thing. Now, some snow, but this is not recent snow, but the snow that settles on the top of the mountain. Indulge me. A little fresh snowfall. There we are. That's the easily scaled Mont Blanc, and I could not have Christmas without it. <laughs> Girls, you are in luck. Here we are. Oh, oh, wow. Wow.
It always seems like a good idea to have a party at Christmas time, but unless you're careful, it can go hideously wrong. I mean, suddenly you feel like some deadline pressured, stressed out professional, or not so professional caterer. I don't want to be a caterer. I want to eat with my friends and have them around me at Christmas. So I certainly don't do those fussy canopy sort of food origami things. I want food that's simple and delicious and feels like a treat at the same time. I mean, for example, my sweet and sticky ribs. How can that not be good? And what's lovely about these as well is that the whole house smells so welcoming as people come in, so the party gets off to a good start. I always do my Parma ham bundles. I mean, three ingredients and incredibly simple to make. I rather think that my friends wouldn't come to a party if they didn't know beforehand they were going to have my crab cakes with lime spritzed on them at the end. A party, like a meal, needs a good ending, so I finish with a wonderful, decadent, sweet mouthful. <laughs> My first strategy in making Christmas party food joyously undemanding is to get the preparation done ahead. And well, I should say, really, that by preparation, I'm not talking about a vast array of activity. I'm talking about about five minutes' work. Well, not even that. So here is the wherewithal for my sweet and sticky ribs. A bit messy, I agree, but you know, you can always give people baby wipes. And I have three magic ingredients for this. The first, sweet chilli sauce, either Thai or Chinese. The only important thing is that it is the sweet kind, not the really, really punchy, fiery kind. The best way of thinking about a marinade like this is not to think of weights and measurements, but just proportions. And for me, it's two parts of the sweet chilli sauce to one part cranberry sauce. Not quite in the same register, but for Christmas I have to have it. To one part sweet black soy sauce. Look at that sweet, thick, black, shiny syrup I've got here. And in it goes. All that gorgeous gloop. And then I want the juice of a clementine. Oh, lovely. And I have to say, I haven't got any such seasonal excuse for the lime, but I do think to offset all that very desirable sweetness, it is good to have some more acerbic note, and the sourness of lime is perfect. And the wonderful thing about this marinade or sauce is that it's so adaptable. I mean, I use this quite often for chicken wings. And although I don't marinade sausages, if you just dunk cocktail sausages in this mixture and then roast them in the oven, they are perfect. So they just need to sit in the fridge till this evening. And then I'll take them out, stick them in a hot oven about an hour and a half before the party. And then when everyone gets there, they are going to be succulent, almost melting off the bone and really sweet and juicy. get everything ready for the party but because I wanted to look like some sort of bacchanalian feast I do my decorating shopping at the greengrocers and I found some really fabulous clementines with leaves so beautiful and what I like with these I said you know like a bacchanalian feast but actually I think there really is something almost Roman about the way grapes can just tumble down over the edges of things. It makes everything look so beautiful in a sort of ready-to-be-debauched Roman scene kind of a way. A few more grapes here. But despite all this talk of Bacchanalian abandon, uh, my mother's insistence on not forgetting about detritus and practicality means I've got some pewter bowls around so that a few grape pips and satsuma or clementine peelings can be put there. Oh, and you have to have, I have to have, gold coins at Christmas and scatter these about as well. 
Really, what I want is that the minute people come in, they feel that sense of being surrounded by good things to eat. And I think it's that that provides warmth and welcome. This is a continuing part of my prepare ahead strategy. I suppose you could say what I'm making is like a homespun version of Reese's peanut butter cups. And it's very useful, I have to say, to have something sweet at the end of a party because that way, you know, you don't want to start turning the lights up and down like you used to get at a disco. So I think this way, something sweet comes out, they know no more food, it's time to sort of wind down. The base is made up partly of icing sugar, and then I sort of feel, please don't look too closely because you're going to start worrying about this isn't really very good for you. It's not really that good for you, but it's Christmas. Anyway, some dark sugar. You can think about your waistline and your dietary virtue in the new year, if you must. A little bit of butter. Anyway, you know, they're quite small, these. You don't have to eat an awful lot. And now, the uber-important ingredient, peanut butter. I buy that self-righteous organic hessian weave peanut butter, but it just won't play here. I'm going to mix these together in my mixer, just because I like using it. But to be honest, you can see from these ingredients that a wooden spoon and a regular bowl would be just fine. And this just needs to be mixed until it starts clumping together like, like wet sand. That's about ready. I'm just going to squash this rather lovely manila coloured sand into each cup and go on your merry way until all are filled. Just going to add the chocolate, and I do find this mixture of dark and milk chocolate perfect for this. I'm going to adorn these little beauties with some jewellery, especially for Christmas. Look at them. Lovely Christmas trinkets. There is absolutely no point giving a party, if you're so tense and wound up about everything, you just hate everyone for coming. So, as well as the planning ahead strategy that I go in for to make everything bearable and even enjoyable, I also believe you've got to do some things which are ridiculously simple, but still really fabulous to eat. I mean, in a way, it's just an Italian classic, or, or my take on it, you know, just parma ham and figs. So this is my Christmas version, which uses dried figs, and. It works because you've got incredible parma ham, salty and pink, and some sharp goat's cream cheese, which you can get at the supermarket, and then a soft, sweet, slightly crunchy dried fig, or just a snipped off piece of it, and then make a little parcel, a little Christmas present of it. And when it's loosely wrapped, you can transfer to a plate. And along with this, I'm going to have another Italian-inspired offering. When I was young, I went to Milan, and I remember being really taken by all these really frighteningly chic Milanese ladies who, when they had parties, would just cut up a huge parmesan into wild sort of wedges and shards. And I just thought, when I'm grown up, I'm going to do that. So I do. So the ribs have to come out of the fridge and then I'm going to get them in the oven and get everything underway and then we are rocking and rolling. Now, some crab cakes. I think it's quite nice to have another little something that's hot this time of year and these are so easy the work of moments if that 
I like to use spring onions rather than the normal onions in these because you get the onion taste lighter without the onion afterbreath, which is kind of handy for a party. OK, and a clove of garlic, and then a blitz now for adding the other ingredients. Perfect. The other ingredients are fairly simple. These are crab cakes, so in goes the crab meat. It's just white crab meat here. And now a few flavourings. I want to add some wasabi here, which is like a Japanese paste, kind of a cross between horseradish and mustard. And I love the heat it gives, and also the <laughs> glorious green goo. I like to sprinkle on a little rice vinegar. It seems to set off the sweetness of the crab. Not much. Perfect. Some soy sauce. To bind this mixture together, I use rice flour. What I really love is the brown rice flour I get from the health shop, but use regular, just ordinary white rice flour from the supermarket. OK. And a blitz to mix. And that's all there is. All that remains is to fry these later in a bit of oil. I'm going to sit the mixture in the fridge for a while just to firm up, but it gives me time to finish getting the room ready and start getting myself ready. Would you like to have my Christmas in a glass cocktail? What, what's this? this is ginger ale. Cranberry. Cranberry. Oh, that's delicious. I know. I like the gingerbread. So you It's a kind of really broken chunk of parmesan. <laughs> you see, everything's going well. Everyone's looking after themselves. Nothing like a bit of food and that Christmas spirit in a glass. I can just sneak out, no one's missing me, and check the ribs, which are just as they should be, really browned by the heat and all gorgeous and just need to be tonged. That's the easiest way, I think out onto a large plate. Mm, they're really tender, falling off the bone. Perfect. Now I'm just going to sprinkle with a bit of coriander, although I do think when you eat them like this, you have to make sure there's someone on duty to tell you if you've got green stuff in your teeth. <laughs> it's kind of a homemade barbecue sauce. Yum. Chili and sweet soy. I'm taking a very meagre one, but it's not something. <laughs> I'm going to break away from the crowd for a moment to do a bit of last minute frying up of the crab cakes and actually I don't feel apologetic about that and I don't regard it as a penance, I mean on the contrary one of the things I like at Christmas altogether but at parties is finding that little bit of quiet space by yourself while you cook which you can't really get in any other way and everyone thinks you're working incredibly hard so it's good for everyone just two teaspoons is fine, just squish them down. You can roll them about in your hands, but then you would smell a bit like a crab cake.
Okay, okay, I know it's a seasonal hazard, but I'm in danger of losing my Christmas cheer. Even the fairy light's too much for me now. What I need is a bowl of something restorative, and in that bowl, I need something hot and a lot of carbohydrate. The heat I'm going to get from this chorizo sausage, or what remains of it, in the fridge. Oh, I think I'll turn the pan on now. Chop up the chorizo sausage. I feel that help is on the way. And this chopped fairly small, but let's not go mad. In this goes. And this is just the right sort of heat because there's something really fabulously sort of chewy and salty and even a bit sour about the kind of chilli flavour in this. Mm. OK, so in with that, some spring onion. This knife wouldn't bang so much against the wood. Enough. And... I think I need a tomato. In an ideal world, I would peel and de-seed. But uh, let's not kid ourselves, that's going to happen now. This will be fine. I need some spice in here. Cumin. Cumin is, actually is perfect. Now, what this is, is a kind of thick, spicy, black bean soup. Got some black beans. Known in my house as the Cuban cure. It is indeed a cure for all ills, especially self-inflicted ones. Needs some stock. Just going to use some hot water from the kettle and some instant chicken stock. The deal about this is that it is both a salve and also a slight shock to the system. You're going to get make yourself a better one way or another, or both. Into the bowl. Mm. Some coriander. Seen better days, but then haven't we all? I need lime in this. I don't, oh, oh. This will do. No time to be messing around. Come, heal me. Cook, heal thyself. Mm. Oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> 